Are you interested in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, but not sure if it's worth the price? Would you like an overview of what this campaign setting offers? Did Wizards put any effort at all into this blatant cash grab? Let's find out. Hey, Lucart here. I have been a Dungeon Master since high school, and I create weekly D&D videos with information and resources to help Dungeon Masters run awesome games. I'm John James, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school, and a Magic player since middle school. And I have opinions. Many, many opinions. Today, we're going to be doing a review of the new campaign setting, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So, Luke, what did you think of the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica? Dude, that's not what the script says. You're... I haven't read the book. You're supposed to be doing the review. That's why I'm bringing you on my channel. Um, just, just a second. All right, so real quick, before we jump into the review itself, can we just give people an idea of the different things you're going to be talking about? Yeah, um, first I'm going to talk about the art and the maps that are in the book. Okay. Um, then I'm going to talk about the world building, mm -hmm. um, kind of the, the fluff, if you will. Um, then the player options. Races, classes, uh, magic items. Um, I'd like to talk about the monsters and NPCs that are in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to focus for a while on the hooks and plots. Um, kind of the adventure hooks, the stuff that gets your campaign rolling. Okay. And then finally I want to spend a little time talking about um, the fact that this is the first setting book in, f in the 5th edition uh, repertoire. So what those are going to look like based on this and how, okay. how this took that setting approach. All right, cool. Sounds good. All right, this should be fun. All right, so the first thing that, before we actually get into the review of the book, I just want to mention real quick that we did a video, a previous video, a part one to this, where we actually, yeah, part one, we actually, it's not actually linked here. There's nothing to point at. You could put it. Oh, we could put it up in the card. I could put this up in the card if I remember to. Um, anyway, there is a part one that we actually talk about and give an introduction to Ravnica and the Planescape, not Planescape, Magic yeah. the Gathering multiverse and stuff like that. So this, there, it's possible, I don't know, the review of this book itself might make more sense if you watch the first part. And we're probably yeah. going to be talking about stuff in the review that is specific to like the Magic the Gathering universe and stuff like that. Yeah. And we're not going to explain a lot of those terms in this mm -hmm. video. So if, if it's a little confusing or something, you might it might behoove you to watch the first video and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I, mean, I kind of wanted the first video to be kind of uh, an introduction to magic and... Uh, Ravnica for people who don't know about it. Right. Um, and I didn't want to talk too much about the book on that one other than just looking at how they did things. Um, whereas this one, conversely, I want to look at this more as how good of a D&D book is this, not right. how good a job did they do of translating magic into D&D. So if, they want to, if, if people want to learn about how well they translated magic into D&D, that would be our first video that we did. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. They kind of have to read between the lines, I guess, because I wasn't going to really talk about that a whole lot in either of them. Okay, so now I think our viewers are really confused. Yeah. But what we, we can definitely say is that you <laughs> might want to consider watching part one. <laughs> All right, cool. So the first thing we want to take a look at for the review of this book is the art. Yeah, um, you know, art is something that is a nice thing to have in a book, but mm -hmm. doesn't make or break the book. So I wanted to just kind of start with that. But I think this book has just amazing art. I think they really yeah. benefited from um, borrowing art from Magic the Gathering. Um, here's so just like a random page I flipped to. Yeah, we'll try to get that up Pretty there so you guys can... spreads and everything. No, so you said... Um, kinda... no, no, this isn't all original then. They borrowed this from pre-existing stuff for Magic? Yeah, there's at least a handful of pieces of art that I definitely recognize. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, I could flip through them, but it doesn't really help any. Um, that I definitely recognize for Magic cards. Um, I've also seen a few that they've used in the Magic stories. Um, mm -hmm. I think just kind of being able to team up their art purchasing power. You yeah. Know, they only have so much budget to spend on art. And being able to pull from three different, well, from six, seven, eight, eight or so different sets of Ravnica, sets, different sets of magic set on Ravnica, right. as well as the budget that magic has for extra art, and mm -hmm. then the budget that the book would normally have for art. Yeah. You know, they're obviously going to have be, have a, a lot of opportunity there, and I think they seize yeah. that. Now, I because today we met at lunch mm -hmm. to kind of do like a little prep for this video and stuff. Yeah. And like I was flipping through that thing, and mm -hmm. like literally has like every other page has a piece of art on it. Yeah, so it's got tons of art on it. Yeah, and it's really good art too. Um, you know, I think in a lot of the D and D books, you see that you know there's obviously a lot of um, returning artists who are really well established yeah. and good artists, but I think you see a lot of like debut artists who maybe haven't you know cut their chops in yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this one like 
it's just a lot of really well done art. Everything looks really yeah. polished and finished. Um, and they also, I think, were able to spend a lot more of the budget that, than they normally would have on maps. So they have a map for each guild uh, of one of the uh, buildings that that guild controls, basically. Okay. Um, and I, I know in your previous review, um, the maps were... Oh, for the not, Mad Mage? Yeah, the Mad Mage one. The maps yeah. weren't really to your liking. Yeah. They were kind of that CG uh, I gave it like, I gave it like style. two dragons. Yeah, well, the maps in this one, you know, you showed the maps that you like. They've got the little cross-hatching and the little yeah. hand-drawn thing. These are all like that, every map. And they've got, okay. you know, like I said, ten different... Are these full-color maps? No, they're black and white. They're black or, and white, you know, okay. black and off-white. Okay, but there's... It looked uh -huh. like there was some artistic value to it, though. Yeah. They were, like, pleasing to the eye. It wasn't yeah, just something stylized. like... Yeah, they're stylized. Okay. Let's see if I can... Yeah, why don't you give them... Just give, we'll try to give you, like, a close-up of the maps. Here's one. So you guys can see what they kind of look like. Hold that. Let the camera focus on it for a moment. Yeah, there you go. That's probably pretty good. Yeah. So, so that's uh, what's that? Selesnia. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah, cool. So that's a Selesnia village. Okay. You know, like I said, they've got the cross hatching yeah. and stylized. They've got stuff in the rooms. They're not just empty walls. Yeah, that was another thing with the Man Mage. It was just like yeah. empty walls. So you can't even. You don't even know what's in the room. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I didn't want to spend too long on the art, but I just okay. wanted to basically mention that it's really good, and I think they benefited from teaming up with Magic. Although, if you are a Magic player. Mm -hmm you're going to recognize a lot of the art. So if that's okay. going to be unfortunate for you, something to consider. Yeah. Um, so I give the art five out of five drakes. You mean dragons, right? Drakes. Dr dragons. I'm, I'm doing something different. I'm doing drakes. This is my YouTube they're, channel. They're drakes. It's my review. Five what? out of five drakes. All right. We're take a <laughs> small commercial break here while we talk about this. All right, so we hashed that out. It's going to be dragons. But drakes. the next, the next thing that we're going to be talking about is world building. Yeah, um, so I think the world, the kind of the flavor of the world, um, aside from game mechanics um, and what it has to offer on that front, and like besides stat blocks and everything, mm -hmm. uh, one of the big questions is like, what does this have to offer fluff wise? You know, how much right. resources am I going to have as a dungeon master? I mean, that's all. That's all campaign setting is. It's fluff. Pretty much. Yeah. You know what I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So how much am I going to have to fall back on when my players surprise me, basically? Right. Um, and. It's got a ton on the guilds. If you're interested okay. in the 10 guilds, you know, it's got missions for every guild. It's got villains for every guild. It's got plot right. hooks for every guild. It's got, like, ways to progress in your guild. If you're in a guild, you mm -hmm. can get promoted. You can work your way up and become a guild master. It's got all that for all 10 guilds. And so that's just, yeah. like, pages and pages of stuff on the guilds. However, if you aren't into the guilds... Right. There's not much left for you. So so most of the book is about the guilds? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, like percentage-wise, what do you think? Like 95. So 95% of the pages <laughs> in the book have to do with the guilds? Yeah, I mean, even the monsters are... Oh. Some of the monsters are guild are, are not affiliated with the guild, but almost every single one of them is only for one or two guilds. Um, okay. So yeah, way heavy on the guilds. Um, okay. Which you now, know, now do you view that as a good thing or a bad or a neutral or it depends on your point it, of view? It just depends on what you're looking to run. If you're okay. looking to run, um, you know, interguild intrigue and espionage and stuff, that's great. Yeah. If you were looking for a city plane right. book, if you were like, I don't care about Ravnica, but I want to run a campaign on a city. Yeah. Oh, this is a plane that's all city. Perfect. Right. This isn't good. This isn't what you're looking no. for. No. So it's not. It's not, is... it's not like Waterdeep or something where there's this massive city for you to do stuff in. Right. I mean, there is a massive city to do stuff in. It's just all about the guilds. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Got so it. yeah, I mean, if if that's what you want, if that's what you're interested in, mm -hmm. um, there's that, and I think it there's a lot of politics in, in it. They talk about a lot mm -hmm. about how the guilds interact with each other. Right. And all that so there's a lot of potential there and it's i think it's good solid world building but just yeah. uh you know there was different ways it could go and they went yeah. full on the guilds so now so you mentioned mm -hmm. politics and stuff like that so if we're yeah. if you if, if a dungeon master has like a group of players who are your like beer and pretzels type of players mm -hmm. they want to kick down doors and kill monsters um yeah. do you think this would fit in for a group like that yeah um you'd have to build your campaign for it for sure mm -hmm. um there's there's certain guilds that would work really well for that. Like okay. Rakdos is kind of a sadistic guild. They have lots of demons okay. and witches and just kind of generically evil stuff. So mm -hmm. if you want one where you can just like point people at something and let them hack and slash their way okay. through it, there's guilds that that would work really well for. Okay. Um, 
But you just have to choose it carefully. Okay, basically. so it, it could appeal to that if you build it that way. Yeah. But it also sounds like, well, the politics and stuff, you could also run a game that's like politically centered as well. I think that's where it really shines a lot more. And okay. I've started uh, designing my own campaign in this setting already. Okay. And cool. I'm definitely going into the politics side because it's just... It's interesting, and I don't think you have as much potential for it in a lot of other settings. Right, yeah. Um, just because it really... I mean, you, you can obviously make whatever you want. Sure. Um, but you're making up the whole thing at that point. Yeah. Whereas this one gives you a it's lot there. to lean on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to mention about the world building is that it's very focused on a specific section of the plane. So I mentioned that Ravnica is kind of a plane that's... A, a whole plane that's a city. So it... You know, yeah. it's conjectured that the entire plane of Ravnica, corner to corner, whatever shape Ravnica is, maybe it's yeah. a flat world, a circle, I don't know. Uh, flat Earth theory. <laughs> flat Ravnica. Flat Ravnica. <laughs> Some of the planes actually are different shapes. They've oh, established yeah. that. There's Not one cool. actually that's uh, a Dyson sphere. Um, but cool. side note. <laughs> anyway, um, but it focuses on one district of this plane, the 10th okay. district. Um, okay. Which kind of makes this plane feel a little smaller than it could have been. I think, mm, you know, when you hear of the plane that's all, like, a whole plane that's yeah. the city, you think of just, like, this huge, sprawling metropolis that's yep. just endless. But this one focuses on a very, fairly small area of it, mm. um, you know, which, again, is good for some part, some ways of running and less good for others. Yeah, that's interesting because mm -hmm. the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide... <clears throat> did a similar thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a campaign setting book, yeah. but it like really just focuses on one specific part mm -hmm. of the Forgotten Realms. Yeah. You know? And I know like when I run campaigns, I usually have a lot of time where like the players are walking for a week. Yeah. You know, they camp and every night we roll to see if they have a random encounter. Yeah. There's not a week's worth of walking in this book. You know, they could walk right. from one side of the city to the other well well short of that time. As You'd far have as to roll random encounters book. like every like 10 minutes or something. Yeah, basically. Oh, okay. Which kind of makes sense for something as populated as a plane sure. or as a, a city. A city, but, yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it's just, like I said, a different approach than they might have taken. Right. Um, but okay. it might be disappointing to some people. Right. But, I mean, that's the purpose of a review, right? Yeah, still, exactly. Let people know what you can expect out of the book. Yeah. And if you're looking for mm -hmm. a city campaign, nah. But if you're looking for like guilds and stuff, you know, mm. especially especially it sounds like politics type stuff. Yeah, guilds and politics is is definitely where this one shines okay. on the world building front, especially. Awesome, cool. So uh, yeah, I'll give this one uh, three point five out of five wyverns for world building. Wyverns. Yeah, they're like dragons, but you know they have just the two wings. That's We're going to talk about this. All right, John, why don't you mm. tell us about player options in the book? Yeah, so this book introduces a number of new player options. Um, there's five playable races. Let's see if I can remember them all. They were going to have Vyashino, but they cut him, which is kind of sad, which are these lizard people. Okay. Um, lizard, they, lizard men? Oh, wait, no, wait. It's Vyashino. They have, they have, they're more hunchback, and they've got a whip tail with a knife blade thingy on the end. Totally okay. different than lizard folk. Lizard, lizard men. Lizard people. Lizard, yeah. I, it used to be lizard men, but then they had to make it like politically correct and say lizard folk or something. I don't something, think they right? had to make it politically correct. I think they chose to make it more accurate. Okay, sure. All right. <laughs> we'll probably but get some things in the comments about people. <laughs> as always, flame in yeah, the comments. Yeah, flame in the comments. <laughs> uh, five playable races. Uh, they did centaurs, uh, minotaurs, vidalcan, which are uh -huh. these kind of logical, blue-skinned people. Okay. Um, so Vulcans. Blue yeah, but blue Vulcan, kind blue, of blue yeah, Vulcan. half half Andorian, half half Vulcan. Okay, right, fair. <laughs> um, what else do they have? Uh, Simic hybrids, which are uh, Simic is one of the guilds, and they're known for like splicing other body parts onto people. Um, cool. So people who have had that done to them, one, two, three, four. What was the fifth one? I'm gonna have to consult the table of contents real here quick. Here we go. He did not properly Tell prepare us in the for this. Comments. Oh, and Loxodon, the most memorable one. Actually, there's more because I, I also forgot goblins. Goblins oh. and Loxodon, which are the coolest one. Okay. They're giant elephant people. They have a probosc a nose they, that uh, they can actually use to... Proboscis? Uh, proboscis. Proboscis? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, cool. Um, that they can actually like use to manipulate objects and stuff. Oh, nice. So they each have... They have a pretty good flavor to most of them. I know they had released some of the um, races as Unearthed Arcana. And they changed mm -hmm. some things from those that some people online were very disappointed about. Oh, really? But if you didn't look at those and only are seeing these ones, I think you'll be satisfied. I, th I particularly like the how they got away from the tradition mm -hmm. of D and D of like all the races being just like humans with slight differences. Like right, yeah. 
uh, you know, and they they actually um, only allow humans and elves from the base core races. So there's no dwarves, no halflings, no half orcs, so, so no dragonborn. So if you're so basically, according to the, the rule book or whatever mm -hmm. the campaign setting, if you're mm -hmm. playing your game in Ravnica, you can have humans, elves, and then the playable races they list here. But you're not yeah. supposed to have things like dwarves, exactly, and like dwar what else we got, dwarger, dragonborn, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like if you run it according to this book, right. like, you're not supposed to have those things. Exactly. Obviously, the dungeon master you could put them in there. Yeah, but it's not part of the world, right? Yeah, I think there's flavor justification for how you could have other ones too because. Okay. It's such a big plane, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of activity with planeswalkers, and there's hints in the story, too, not yeah. to get too much into the magic side of things, but there's been hints in the story that um, a lot of the races are from originally off-world that have been populated by okay. plane traveling. Now, what I find so interesting, they, they have things like mentor, mm -hmm. minotaurs and centaurs, mm -hmm. yeah. which are like typical D&D races. Yeah. So now those are playable races. So they're not, mm -hmm. not everything is from like the Ravinica setting, right? Well, I mean, the Re the Ravnica setting is... Yeah, I said, is, I said it wrong, didn't yeah. I? <laughs> yeah, see, I don't play magic. Tell them in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> like the flame meeting. Like, this guy doesn't know how to pronounce, he can't speak English. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, both D&D &D and magic mm -hmm. are coming out of, like, the Tolkien tradition of fantasy, so they yeah. have a lot of overlap on that front. Okay. And Tolkien's ripping a lot off of Norse mythology and Greek mm -hmm. mythology and everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, centaurs, minotaurs, they're yeah. all from... Uh, sure. But... Yeah, those ones are, and goblins in particular, are kind of standard fantasy races that show up in Ravnica, and then the Luxodon and Vidalkin and okay, uh, well, the Simic hybrids are are cool. kind of original ones for this setting. All right, awesome. Um, and then they have two new subclasses as well um, for the as far as the uh, player options goes. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's one for clerics that is a what do they call it? In the order domain. So they created a new cleric domain for people mm, who want to okay. impose law on people and make things orderly. Okay. Um, cool. And then for druids, they have a new druidic circle called the Circle of Spores. That's for druids who kind of have an affinity with fungi. Fungus? Yep. Ah, okay, nice. The Golgari Guild is very uh, fungus oriented in this yeah. one. So. Okay. Uh, cool. It was kind of created for that one. So there's fewer subclasses than there might have been, um, but they do also reference a lot as far as. Um, w uh, Volos or which ones? Volos and Xanathars that have the player options. Xanathars. I Xanathars. Think. Um, well, no, Volos has some monster playable races. Okay. It might have the okay. other ones too. I don't know. They all. Well, okay, they so they them. reference Xanathars as far as um, which sub, like those subclasses and which guilds okay. they fit into. Okay. So they kind of take all of the D and D classes and subclasses mm. and tell you which guilds are would be they would fit in. Okay. Um, they're, they ask, they kind of explicitly say, like, this is not a you have to do this, but mm -hmm. this is, like, if you want to fit in with your guild, right. this is what would be appropriate. But they they do say, like, you know, you can be someone who doesn't really fit in with your guild, and that could be an interesting role-playing opportunity. Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so there's those for uh, the player creation mm -hmm. options. And then they also have a pretty good number of magic items in this. I don't know if you count those as player options or DN, DM options. It kind of blurs the line a little bit. Um, but they have a good number of pretty cool magic okay. items in it, too. That's cool, because I don't mm -hmm. know if, like, other things have included additional magic items beyond, like, the Dungeon Master Guide. Yeah, I think, know. um, I think it was Volos, or, or maybe, Zan no, maybe it was Xanathar. I always get those two mixed up, because I bought them at the same time. Okay. Um, one of them had a bunch of new, like, but they were just, like, common ones. They're basically mm. useless trinkets. Probably Xanathar, um, would my yeah. guess. But yeah. I don't think they had any new, any that had, like, new powerful solid magic items and this, this one's one got does. a bunch okay. yeah okay cool. um they've got a few that like each guild has has one so it's like yeah. 10 in one kind of thing um but then they've got a bunch of cool weapons and magic okay. items and stuff now if you're if you're just a player that's totally not mm -hmm. interested in ravnica i just want some mm -hmm. playable races and magic items or something mm -hmm. would you buy the book just for that or i mean if all you're looking for is playable races classes and magic items you know you get like i said six playable races mm -hmm. two subclasses and then this list of magic items, okay. which many of which are very focused on the guilds and mm, specific okay. to the guilds. So I don't think that would be much of a selling point. If you're not planning okay. to run, yeah. if you're not planning to play in or run a campaign on Ravnica, yeah. um, I don't know if that one would, would do it for okay. you. Okay, that makes sense. Um, as far as the players go, at least. All right, it's cool. not, I don't think it's really intended for players. I mean, it's a campaign setting, so okay. probably more of a DM kind of book. So um, how many dragons would you give this then? 
Um, I'm giving this five out of five worms with a with a U, worms. In, what was it, so in magic, I know that worms with a Y is a dragon in D&D. Yeah, of course. But worms with a U in magic were originally dragons, but after the Dragon's War, they were their wings were cut off and they were cursed to crawl the earth and they populated the multiverse from there. And so all worms in the multiverse are descendants of once dragons. Right. So, we're so five some, out of five worms. Five out of five dragons. Worms. Right. So five out of five worms. <laughs> All right, cool. So next on our list are the monsters. It, it mm -hmm. sounds like there's a good deal of new monsters available in the, yeah. the book. Yeah, there's tons of new monsters. Um, I didn't count them. Someone, someone tell us in the comments who count, who did the counting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who did the counting? <laughs> How many new but monsters are there? They've got like almost fifty pages of uh -huh. monster of just straight up monsters. Um, so and fifty then, pages. That means that if you have like one on each page, that, that could be close to a hundred, perhaps. And then another thirty pages on top of that of NPCs that each oh, have nice. stat blocks as well. Oh, cool! So they kind of are monsters on that front too. So yeah, there's a lot. Of what's the What's there. the rough like CR range in the monsters offhand? Do you know? They, Was it kind of built toward lower level or higher level? They really run the gamut. Um, you know, they have some NPCs and like little types of things you run into. Um, and then they've got like the guild leaders who are up there in like the teens, the high okay. teens, cool. um, or, or a little lower, but yeah. yeah, they, they, I mean, it's not quite, I don't think there's really anything up around the 20 range or sure. like for a extremely late level campaign, but yeah. they don't, they don't really have a heavy weight in any one, okay. in any one side. So there's a good, there's a good distribution of it then. Yeah. Okay. And, cool. um, they also have a table for each guild that suggests, um, monsters, sorted by uh, challenge rating mm -hmm. that would be appropriate for that guild's territory. Okay. So cool. if you're in an Orzhov Basilica, um, you know, it tells you like, oh yeah, you can run into bats and giant bats and ghosts and zombies and whatnot. No, those are monsters from, from, from the, the Monster From manual. the Monster Manual. And uh -huh. they also point you, again, to uh, Volo's Guide. And, okay. Morning Canes. And I think Morning, there might have been a couple of Morning Canes, but there weren't okay. many because Morning Canes was very focused on a lot of... Uh, Mm -hmm. Stuff that's not in this one. A lot of the demons and the yeah. Kithyanki and the dwarves and stuff that are right, in this right. setting. Okay, so it basically gives you an idea for like... Cause mm -hmm. the, the book is built around running a campaign around the guilds primarily. Mm -hmm. And so it tells you that if you're fighting this mm -hmm. guild or something, yeah. these are the typical types of allies and monsters that you would expect to have. Exactly, Across yeah. all of the different monster manuals that have been mm -hmm. published. Right? Yeah, and I'm, find it, I'm finding it very helpful um, in the campaign I'm building because in a normal D&D campaign, you know, you're like... Okay, my players are walking. Oh, they're going into a cave. All right, mm -hmm. pull out the list of cave monsters. All right, then they defeat the cave. They're walking, you know, random encounter in the forest. Oh, they get to the next cave or whatever. Yeah. I felt like I feel like I struggle in in a traditional D and D setting to like come up with interesting monsters without just going completely random. Right. So it's either like I just went to you know Cobalt Fight Club and clicked random and yep. put in the environment and yeah. gave them whatever came up or they're just running the same thing again and again and again because that's the, like the cool thing about this part of the campaign, mm -hmm. um, and so I think this one has really interesting opportunity for like like I mentioned if you're in the, an Orzov Basilica they give you a list yeah. of all the different things that you could run into there all across the challenge ratings, mm -hmm. and so you get a different flavor to each region. Yeah. Uh, more than it's it's more different than just like environmental differences. It's okay. actually got its own like NPC flavor and its own aesthetic and everything. Yeah. Cool. That sounds that sounds sweet. Um, and then I mentioned they also have a section on NPCs by guilds, which are, mm. again, they each have a stat block, so they could, you know, you can consider them monsters or not. They have a yeah. similar thing in the monsters manual where they sure, yeah. where they have the <clears throat> little list of cultists and wizards and whatnot in the back. Right. Yeah. Um, but these ones are organized by guild, um, which can be useful if you're looking for a specific guild, um, mm -hmm. and it's where each of the guild masters' stat blocks are as well. Um, they also do an interesting thing uh, where they uh, have a lot more role-playing information for the um, guild masters than they usually have for NPCs. Oh, okay. They tell you their bonds and ideals and flaws. Oh, nice. That's cool. As if they were player characters uh, yeah. so that you can... Because they figure uh, most of the time you're running into guild masters, you're probably not fighting them. You're appealing yeah. to them, trying to uh -huh. make a deal or you okay. know, getting in trouble or whatever, but you're probably not actually in combat because most of the time if you're up against a guild master, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, they he's probably, he's probably not alone either. He's probably got like exactly. this whole guild behind him. Yeah, exactly. They're yeah. they're not alone. They've got the backing of their entire guild. The, yeah. By definition, the entire guild's at their beck and call. Right. So it would be a pretty extenuating circumstances where you would be going up against the guild master. So I really appreciate yeah. that they gave you 
the stat blocks, but they also gave yeah. you more information on how to run them. Yeah, that's that's cool. I don't know mm -hmm. that I've seen that. I mean, in some of like the adventure modules, mm -hmm. you'll have that type of information. Yeah. But like just a, accompanying a stat block and like mm -hmm. say a monster manual, you never find that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think it's really cool because. I think that can be one of the hardest things to come up with as a DM mm -hmm. is like, you know, you've got to make the world, if you're running a new world, you've got to make the adventure and the plot and everything. Yeah. And then when someone run in, runs into an NPC, you've got to make up that that character's personality and yeah. everything. And it's hard to make a fleshed out personality, especially if you weren't prepared for it. Right. Yep. So to just have these um, pre-built ones for you is really handy. And, yeah, it's cool. and because they're the the like way, they're like the focus of the guild, they push, mm -hmm. they kind of push the guild in the direction it's going. They're also a good model for how other NPCs in that guild might act as well. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So I think it's a really cool feature to have those stat blocks. Um, but I did want to say um, they have a section on monsters, mm -hmm. a bestiary they call it, yeah. which is mostly, um, you know, like, they're mostly guild-based monsters still. They, like, they have an angel section. It says mm -hmm. Boros Angels and then Orzov Angels. Um, and then, you know, they've got... A lot of different monsters that are uh, yeah. specific to a guild, um, but they're all in the bestiary section. Uh -huh. Then after that, they have the NPC section. Okay. And alphabetically, find the NPC you're looking for. No, right? sorted by guild. So when you're looking through these guild tables okay. at the beginning, uh -huh. you know, you're I'm in my Orzov Basilica. I'm reading through it. It says, "Oh, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna find the um, Orzov Advocate, which is one of the Orzov NPCs." I right. go flipping to the bestiary. Okay, well, it's not under A for Advocist. Oh, it's probably an NPC. So I have to go back to the Orzov section and find it there. And so you're just flipping back and forth a lot, trying to find where they put it. They didn't put page numbers, which is unfortunate, but yeah. they're just not in like an order. So there's some usability concerns with finding things then. Yeah, I think if I had designed it, I would have I just put the whole thing in order of guild. Yeah. Because that's really how you're going to run into something in this campaign. And so okay. I think it makes a lot of sense to have it that way. And yeah. they should have just put the monsters, the, the bestiary sections, alongside the NPCs in the guild. And just had them both in a row. Yeah, and, um, and somewhere you could have had a table alphabetically naming them with page numbers too, right? Yeah, that's another thing now that you mention it. Um, here's the end of the book. You'll notice this doesn't look like an index. This is a stat like, block. It's a stat block. That's the end of the book? There's, like, yeah, there's, there's no not even, index? There's not even like a bleed page or whatever. There's just like, bam, done. Maybe they ran out of paper. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot in it, so it could happen. But yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Like I got to the end and I just like flipped the page and that yeah. was it. There was, it's, it just ends on an NPC without. Wow, not nothing. But yeah, no index or anything, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously once they get it into like Cobalt Fight Club, I'll just use that for my index like I normally would anyway, but. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah it's an unfortunate way to end it but okay but there's tons of new monsters yeah tons of cool npcs you know more npc information than we usually get mm -hmm. so i'm giving the monsters five out of five half dragons so wait so 2.5 dragons no five out of five half dragons they're each their own point they're like, they're so like how do you stars. how do i represent a half dragon with my little symbol icon thing i'm sure you can find a half dragon symbol on yeah but then, it's gonna, but then it's gonna look like i gave it like 5.5 5, that they're gonna have trouble figuring out how many five dragons out of they five give. half dragons they're just this is your part i i just say it you have to represent it yeah i have to do the video editing <laughs> good luck all right according to our sheet here the next thing that we're gonna be talking about is hooks and plots yeah so uh this is the when i started making my campaign that's kind of the first thing i was looking yeah. for um you know i need a way to uh, a conflict to draw the players in and there's different ways of DMing. You know, a lot, some DMs like to just kind of have a monster of the week kind of feel or whatever, mm -hmm. where you get you have a party yeah. and they just go around fighting whatever is next. Yeah, um, with uh, might, have, might have sounded disparaging or whatever, but yeah, we're not. It's a we viable... not yeah, we're not mocking DMs who run that style of <laughs> it's, game. Yeah, it's you a know, very viable is, way to this run. This is it. a very um, this is like a very inclusive yeah. <laughs> channel to be on. But God, personally, when I DM, I like to have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but personally, when I run it, I like to have like one big plot that they're working on the whole time. And yeah. obviously, they're going to run into conflicts on the way, and they're going to have to do some side quests and get distracted and sure. everything. Mm -hmm. But I like to have them moving towards one goal that's kind of established from the beginning. Okay. Um, and I felt like this book didn't really give me much to work with on that. Okay. Um, you know, they, they have, for each guild, they have a table that tells you, 
I mean, they give you a lot of information for the guilds that yeah. is really cool for this. They give you a table of hooks for each guild. They give you a table of villains for each guild. They give you a table of side quests for each guild. Um, but they're all pretty small things. Mm -hmm. There's no, um, there's no big, like, I didn't see any of them that, that just, like, made me want to run a campaign to work towards that. They were like, you know, go stop this riot. Like, that's one thing. Like, I'm, that's one session. After that, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, it seems like they could have done something where, I'm just spitballing here, but, like, each guild mm -hmm. might have some major thing that could mm -hmm. be an entire campaign. Yeah, exactly. A whole campaign plot for a guild. Yeah. And, um, another thing that I would have liked to see uh, on that front is rather than having these hooks so built on the guilds, mm -hmm. um, the way I see this running a lot of times is that players from would be from different guilds. Each you know you'd get uh -huh. players have different different things that appeal to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you've got you know this the crazy spellcaster dude who wants to be from Is it, and you've mm -hmm. got the do-gooder, you know, order cleric who's from Azorius and everything. Okay. Um, and they've, they're from all these different guilds. Um, I would have liked to see uh, kind of plot suggestions more for, that were outside of the guilds. Okay. What could all the, what could bring all these different guilds together to work on? And they're so focused on the guilds that it's like, you, you know, it's like I grab people from four different guilds and they're fighting against someone from a fifth guild or whatever. And yeah. I would have liked to see like, Here's something that all the guilds would have a stake in. Gotcha. So like, and I I felt like that was kind of lacking here. Um, okay, that makes sense. They give you a lot of other stuff for villains and everything, but yeah, there wasn't much outside of the guilds, um, and that's one of the things I'm really struggling with on my campaign. Yeah. Is you know I want them to run into the other guilds a lot. Right. Um, I want them to have conflict with other guilds, but I don't know what my players are gonna play yet. I don't know what guild they're going to pick. So if yeah. if I build my guild around Orzov being the bad guys and one of the players wants to play an Orzov character, mm -hmm. I either just have to say, sorry, you don't get to play that character that you want. Right. Um, which, you know, is a viable option, but kind of sad. Or, uh, you know, you're going to have to go against your own guild, which kind mm -hmm. of, you know, puts them in an awkward position roleplay-wise because all the other people might have the backing of their guild, whereas they're actively going against their guild. Interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have liked to see more of that um, one of the things I do like about the hooks and plots for the guilds is, like I said, they have a villain table for each guild, and yeah. I think they have, let me look on the number, but they have tables for each guild for all different things, um, and they give reasons why each guild would be the bad guy. So there's a D8 okay. table for each guild uh, for how, what a villain might be for each guild. There's a D6 guild table, so you know, 8 times 10 guilds, there's 80 villains in this book. You know, there's uh, side quests. They yeah. call it assignments, but they're side mm -hmm. quests. Yeah. Um, there's six of those for each guild, so there's 60 side quests in here. There's, again, 60 adventure hooks in here. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a lot of different... Oh, and then there's adventures. Those are more like side quests, too. And there's right. 12, so there's 120 of those. So yeah. there's a lot of those, but they're all so focused on the guilds. Yeah, you do um, math really fast. That's pretty... That's I mean, it's easy when you're multiplying by 10. That's okay. the one I always had down. Oh, fair. <laughs> fair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was, I, I, I love that they have a villain for each guild, even yeah. the, the good oh. ones. Um, right. Because, you know, they don't have, mm -hmm. one of the things I talked about in the other video is the way, the way that, um, they don't really have the same alignment system. Right. Um, and that's, I think, I think I'm going to talk about that farther down somewhere, um, okay. in the last section, to, uh, in this video, but, um, in, it, when they assign them stat blocks, they give them alignments, lawful or... You know, waffle or chaotic, good or evil. I mean, yeah. so there's guilds that are good, um, and they give you ways for them to be villains. So that's it's a nice way that you know a good party can run against a good villain, and you can justify it in the game, which is yeah, which makes for a more interesting play than I, I think the traditional just like you're a bunch of good guys. There's a bad guy. Go beat him up. Right. I definitely I like I like the. It, it seems mm -hmm. though that like they kind of have it pitched in, in, in a way they're imagining that you would have one guild be the focus of players going against that guild or something. If they're giving so. like hooks as for villains and stuff like that, mm -hmm. does it kind of feel that way that they had envisioned that you playing it that way? That does seem to be how it's built. Um, okay. They have some like party creation suggestions at the mm -hmm. beginning and some of them are like, you know, you can run a party of all one guild, which... Mm -hmm. It's going to appeal to some groups, but I think most groups are going to want to be right. cross-guild. Yep. Um, and so they have, like, some ideals that, like, multi a few guilds might be into. Yeah. But they don't have a lot 
that would tie an entire party from any num any guild together. Um, okay. But again, it's really cool that you could fight against any guild that yeah. they picked. They took all ten, and there's ones that are like kind of good. I mean, they're all you know they're they're good alignment. Yeah. They have you know morals that you might agree with, huh. but you still might end up in conflict with them. Yeah, that's interesting. You might almost you almost might almost build a campaign where. Like, you kind of do a tour of guilds, you know? Yeah. Like, you're going to kind of fight against a bad guy in this guild, and this guild, and this guild. And players mm -hmm. who are from a variety of guilds, mm -hmm. a lot of the times are going to find themselves with the backing of their guild, but they might mm -hmm. find themselves in a spot where they have to go against their own guild, and that's a exactly. little touchy on that subject, right? Yeah, and that's exactly how I'm building um, my campaign. Mm, okay. Um, you know, they're fighting against... Uh, well, I don't want to say too much, because one of them... Oh, yeah, one of, your, video, one, of your, but... one of your players watches this channel. <laughs> I think so. Um, okay. But, you know, they're, they're going to fight against one guild, uh, but, you know, in doing so, they're going to be facing, they're going to come into conflict with other guilds as well. Yeah. They're going to have to leave that guild's territory and run into some of the other ones. Mm. And I think that's the most interesting way to run in this setting, because mm -hmm. honestly, who wants to take this setting with ten guilds that have all this politics and intrigue between yeah. them, and they're super well developed, and there's advancement opportunities and everything, right. and then just focus on one the whole time? Yeah. Like, the cool thing is to run into all of them. And that's why I'm so bummed that I didn't see anything that was just like, you know, here's something all the guilds can get together about. Yeah. Um, hmm. But yeah, I think it's cool if you can bounce around from guild to guild. You know, you're against some of... You could even run up against some of the party's own guilds and, and have some conflict there. Yeah. Or maybe they could circumvent the conflict because they have the backing of their guild. I think that's another cool possibility, too. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's cool. What else you got on this here? Yeah, so I want to talk about the alignment thing. Um, so I mentioned they have all ten uh, of the guilds here, um, and they don't have the same alignment system. Um, you know, a lot of Magic players that also play D and D like to make, you know, take the D and D nine nine alignment grid yep. and like try to guess which guild goes where or yeah. whatever. Uh -huh. um, and I've done that myself. Um, but yeah, they didn't. Uh, they didn't like make them one for one in this one by any right, means. Right. Um, so I think there's, like, multiple that are lawful good or whatever. Yeah, I think there's multiple that are lawful good. There's probably, there's multiple that are lawful evil. Um, there's not as many, I don't think there's any that are true neutral in this one. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I think the alignment system in d and D. I I don't think it translates super well to go from the magic, you know, the, the magic setting where it's built on the colors and yeah. the conflicts between those colors and, and, you know, the ideals of those colors to... The kind of more traditional good versus evil storytelling that D and D is known for. So they right. they didn't like focus on that much. They basically just you know assign them whatever it is. But okay. that's one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, it's interesting. I, I personally like that this isn't like a good versus evil type of setting. There's not like right, yeah. go stop the naughty necromancer from doing the evil things. Yeah, it's like you know this guild has their own motives and your guild has their own motives and mm. either one of those might be right or wrong or right in your own eyes sure so it's a more of a shades of gray type of thing yeah i think all the guilds um have like potential for good and evil um the golgari is one of the evil guilds who in the magic story right now are actually pretty sympathetic um yeah they're in the magic story they actually don't even come across as very evil they're kind of the yeah they they kind of are the refuse disposal of ravnica um okay. they kind of live in the undercity and you know, clean up all the crap, uh, convert it into fungi that people can eat and whatever. Okay. So they're not particularly <laughs> evil. Um, you know, they've got their own conflicts within the guild. Yeah. That's another thing that comes up a lot is like conflicts within the guild versus conflicts with other guilds. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it was just interesting. And I was glad to see that they didn't try to force it too hard into the D&D &D alignment. Yeah. They focused a lot more on the, the ways the guilds interact with each other. Yeah, it's interesting because it seems like alignment sometimes is like a hot topic, you know yeah. what I mean, where people are like, you know, blah, 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 can we get rid of it, do we need right. it, and all that kind yeah. of stuff, so they kind of, it seems like they just dodged that whole type of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, they put it on the list, but, yeah. um, you know, it's in the stat blocks, but that's basically all that comes into play. Yeah. And I think this, what's really cool is this is one of the settings where I think you could really run a mixed alignment party well. Okay. Um, it's obviously like... It, it's notorious that if you know you get one player who wants to play the evil character, yep. and then it ruins I just the whole that campaign. Character off and right, it's, it's just <laughs> it just doesn't work well in most settings. Right. Um, yeah. You're relying on like a shared sense of morality to tie the party together usually. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. 
Or you just end up having to run an evil party for if enough people want to be evil, which can be fun. I've had a lot of fun DMing for evil parties. Yeah. But I think in this one, you could have characters all over the place. You know, you can have your lawful good character alongside your chaotic evil character because there's enough other stuff that they're up against. Okay. Okay, cool. They can, you know, if you've got, I don't know, uh... <laughs> But you you know you could have a Rakdos well, character. You can't make working. Up examples yeah, right? on the spot, dude. You can have a Rakdos character working <laughs> alongside a, um, you know, a um, Azorius character. Yeah. They're, Azorius is lawful good. Rakdos is chaotic evil. They're as opposite yeah. as you get on the pi on the alignment chart. Right. And they could both be against an Orzov because the Azorius doesn't like that the Orzov are you know manipulating the rules, and the Rakdos doesn't like that they're ma taking advantage of them by manipulating the rules. Oh, okay. So they're both in it. You know, they both have a reason to yeah. go against this that's so, outside of the normal morality system. Right, and the guild system mm -hmm. gives you the opportunity to put that into your game. Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, uh, I, I wish, I don't know, I, I gave it one rating, but I actually kind of want to bump it up after talking about it because I think I maybe was selling it a little short. But now, we'll Do you want to talk about the one-shot, though? Oh, yeah, there's also a, a one-shot adventure in here. It's called Cranko's Way. Um, Cranko is a character that came up in one of the cards that kind of a fan favorite character okay. he's, I think he's in maybe like one one of the stories online so like mm -hmm. one little 3,000 word story or whatever yeah um, but he's a, a card that's really popular in one of the formats um, who makes a bunch of goblins and he's like a little mob boss uh, so is he a goblin yeah okay so he's a goblin mob boss oh, so nice. you know you could see how that would be appealing yep uh-huh um, goblins are just always fun and PC oh yeah absolutely um, I can see how that would easily become a fan favorite yeah yeah so they made an adventure uh, starring Cranko. Well, Cranko's kind of the... I think he's the villain of this adventure, really. Um, but he, he he's featured in it anyway. You're trying to chase him down in this adventure. Um, okay. It feels like... It's basically a one-shot adventure. Um, so it's like... Uh, it's like it level like one to two. One to two, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like kind of a, you know, session zero, get your party used to the universe kind of thing, maybe. Yeah, I mean, um, level one... You usually gain level two after one game session. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so then, I think it's a one shot. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's cute. I don't know. They didn't. That it's kind of a bonus as far as I see. I didn't buy it for a pre built adventure, so I wouldn't want them to spend much time on it. Right. If they had but, spent like 20, 50 pages. Yeah, I would have felt cheated. Adventure, yeah, then we would have been complaining about how there's exactly we didn't buy an adventure module. We bought like a campaign setting. Right. Okay. So it's just kind of a, a little example, um, something you can run if you want to just yeah. get something together real quick. Um, okay. Cool. But, yeah, so I, I said I was, I'm ready to go to the rating. I was going to okay. give it 3 out of 5, but I'm actually going to bump it up to 4 out of 5 after talking about it because I, I feel like I, I, I was uh, over -focus, overly focusing on how they could have tied the guilds together more. Okay. Or in, in as far as like an outside of the guild conflict, but for the that's not worth plot, docking two stars over. Yeah, I mean they give you. You'd have to be a cruel yeah. bastard to like dock that many stars over it. Yeah, I mean like I said, they had what 120 different adventures in here. You know, I yeah. can't give it three. I can't dock two stars with it. Okay, so there are enough plots and hooks so, that you think you can bump it up to four, four out of five, five dragons. Hydras. Dragons. Hydras. Hydras. There. You know what? We're just, we're just gonna. We're not even gonna publish this because <laughs> you can't get on board with this. All right, now we're on to the last bit of our review, and what are we talking about? So this is the first settings book in the fifth edition, um, mm -hmm. so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I think it's going to give us some kind of standards that we can expect on the other settings books that are coming out. I think okay. they already announced two more are coming out. Do, which ones did they announce? I don't think they announced what they are. Oh, they, they announced oh. that they're going to be... Oh, okay. Be you know, back in earlier in the year, they announced yeah. there would be three setting books coming right. out, and right. this is the first of them. I want to um, see Dark Zone. I think Dark Zone would be, cool. be fun. I played... The Dark Sun video game on like MS DOS back in the day. <laughs> nice, nice. But I don't remember much about it. It was, it was yeah. kind of like Barbarian World kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Very there was. Low, it's like a yeah. Low tech. Low tech, low mm -hmm. magic. Where there was an option. Well, we, we don't want to talk. Yeah. yeah. This is like a side anyway. conversation. Anyway, back to Ravnica. Yeah. So I think um, <laughs> this book is going to give us an example of what we can expect from the other setting books okay. coming forward. So I wanted to spend some time looking at you know what approaches they took and how well those work. Okay. So the first thing is, and I know this is something, I actually never really paid much attention to this until mm -hmm. you talked about it. Yeah. Um, but this is a mix of PC and DM options. Yeah. So, like we mentioned, there's the player options section, there's the magic items, the playable races, the subclasses. Well, magic items aren't a thing well, that players should even feel. That's feel. true. You know, that's yeah. a DM thing, in my opinion. So there's a, still, um, you know, there's the playable races that yeah. the players definitely need access sure. to. absolutely. There's the subclasses yeah. they definitely need access to. Yeah. And then... 
you know, maybe a third of the book is mm -hmm. um, information on the guilds that any player mm -hmm. of the guild should at least read, I think, their guild section because it talks about, yeah. you know, what your guild stands for, yep. what the structure of your guild is like, mm -hmm. um, how to advance in your guild. It's stuff that is kind of blurs the line between what should be player and DM because the DMs yeah. need to know it too. Yep. But the players definitely need to know it. Um, for their own guild at least. For their own guild, And then yeah. have an overview of the other guilds because they probably would know something about them. Yeah, right? I mean, I think they would need to know the basis basics of the other yeah. guilds, but... They would at least want to read that section, I think, yeah. for their own guild. Okay. Um, so there's, you're going to need the players flipping through this book when you're DMing for this campaign, or for yeah. the setting. Um, but they also have all the bad guys, all the monster stat blocks in the back. They've got all the magic items, so the players are going to flip ahead and they're going to... And they got oh, the stats for all the guild thing. masters. Yeah. So like they're going to be like, should we fight him or not? I don't know. Let's look. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's always that conflict of yeah. like... You know, do I want them to make two different books, and then I have to buy two books for this setting? Yeah, you know, or... this is interesting because I don't, I don't recall if they did this sort of thing in mm -hmm. previous editions, but I'm noticing mm -hmm. this for sure in fifth edition. Mm -hmm. Like, if you look at something like Mordekainen's Tome of Foes, especially, mm -hmm. you know, you have the whole first part that's about like, lore on the races, and then the next yeah. part is like monster stat blocks, mm -hmm. and it's like, and there are playable races in it too. Mm -hmm. It's like, who is this made for? It almost. It I mean, almost makes me feel like, I mean, I can't follow Wizards for want to make money, right? Right. But it almost feels like they're giving both players and Dungeon Masters a reason to buy it, mm -hmm. so they can kind of, like, double dip, so to speak, and get more you people know, to buy their books, you know? I can kind of see both sides, because if, conversely, say they say they wanted to make this Ravnica setting, and they're like, we'll make a book for the players and a mm -hmm. book for the DMs. Yeah. Then as a DM, I feel like I have to buy two books. Or is this okay. way I only have to buy one? Sure. So yeah. I don't know. It could it could go either way. I think I don't think it's new. I think three five did it. Did it? Okay. There were some books that were very player focused. There were some like Monster Manual two, DM's Guide two that were obviously for DM. Yeah. But if you look at like Book of Exalted Deeds, Book of Vile Darkness. Okay. Uh, some of the what was the form of the something of the dragon races of the dragon. Yeah. You know a lot of the split book. Uh, what was it? Complete Divine, Complete Arcane. All those ones had player options. They had new classes, new prestige classes, new races, but they also had, um, you know, all the monsters and stuff in the back. They had spells, they had okay. magic items, they had kind of everything. Yeah. So I don't think it's a new thing. I don't yeah. know. It's, there's different philosophies for how you might do it, and I think they go, f they've tended more towards, like, what makes sense, what groups together logically versus sure. who's the art yeah. target audience for this book. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but it is something... You know, to keep in mind, like you're you're gonna need your players to look through through mm -hmm. this book, um, and there's secret stuff in there that you probably don't want them to see. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know that that's something, and I think like at this point, then or something, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean maybe just yeah, legit buy the PDF. Or buy the PDF. buy the PDF. I don't think you, can, <laughs> you can't. You can obtain the PDF, but I don't think you can buy the PDF. <laughs> no, it was on sale this week. Yesterday. PDF. Yeah, um, on, or no, oh, D&D Beyond. That's D&D Beyond, yeah. Okay. okay, no, we're talking about know. PDF. Is it, you can't buy the PDF in this edition? No, you I can't. I never no, buy PDFs, no, so I, no, the, I just you, use the so print books. You can obtain <laughs> PDFs yeah. online, but you can't buy okay. them. Okay, well, good, that yeah. makes me feel better about when I go about obtaining them. But, you know, whatever, <laughs> make, make copies of the, of the sections for your characters and give yeah. each character their guild's section. Um, and, you know, don't let them flip past the player creation, I guess. Yeah. But I think this is something we're going to have to expect going forward. They've done it. You know, they did it with uh, Volos and uh, Xanath or Mordenkainen. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and they're doing it with the setting books now, yeah. it seems. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're just going to have to come to terms with, I think, is just how this how it's going to be. And like I said, I don't think it's particularly new either. But yeah, sure. it is a point of conversation. Um, sure, absolutely. Fluff versus mechanics um, is always interesting. You know, how much of this is stat blocks and... And you know magic items and yeah. stuff, spell spell description stuff that you know has actual gameplay mechanics and how much of it is like just reading, getting familiar with the universe. And I think it's got a really solid mix. Yeah. Well, it seems um, like for a campaign setting book, mm -hmm. I would expect lots of fluff, right? Yeah. Because that's the whole point. You're giving right. me like a setting to run my game in. Totally. And most of that's fluff. Yeah. I think for fluff. someone, <laughs> we're like saying fluff as though it's a bad thing. I don't think it is. Oh yeah. No, I love but, the fluff. Yeah. Um, Especially in this, um, honestly, for some of the previous books, like uh, for Xanathar's, I thought there was a weirdly high amount of fluff considering mm -hmm. how it was like barely relevant to a setting. It was just like, it yeah. was, I don't know. Um, and I think, you know, um, Morden, 
is it Morgan Kynan's that talks about like the Givianki and everything? Yes. That, okay. Yep. That one spent a long time on the fluff. I think that one yep. was more read more as something that was supposed to be more about the fluff, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, the first you know. part of it definitely was like uh -huh. lore of like really pretty in depth, really yeah, good lore. Totally. Yeah. Um, so this is more like that. It's got a ton of lore. Uh, like I said, it's got tons of information about the guilds, how they mm -hmm. interact with each other, what they want, cool. how they uh, conflict with each other and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also got a lot of stat blocks. We talked about how many monsters it has. It's yeah. got tons of monsters. It's got six new playable races. That's sure. awesome. Like The yeah. number one thing that I look for to buy a book is playable races because my players hate playing humans. They hate yeah. any normal characters. Yeah, I hate humans too. <laughs> yeah. I don't like humans. Um, and so it's always interesting and exciting to have a new race. And especially yeah. stuff like Centaur and Minotaur yeah. that have mm -hmm. been... Stuff that people have liked playing forever, but that never worked well. Like in three five, you had the whole level adjustment thing. Oh yeah, I hated that. Mechanic. It was just a hot mess trying it's to horrible. run it, and I've ran yeah. so many characters who tried to be these, and it was always all over the place. Yeah. So it's really cool to see like a real playable race that was designed to be a playable race in some of these more monstrous races. Yeah. Um, and then they've got the weird Simic hydra hybrids and the Luxodon too, so that's cool. Mm. Um. So yeah, there's there's always there's a good mix, I think, of fluff and mechanics. You're not too heavy. Whichever side you're interested in, you're gonna yeah. get plenty. Cool. Um, That's good. And then the last question is like, does this justify its own book, or should this have been another one of those free PDFs that they were giving away for all the other magic planes? Yeah. Um, and I think like this one is totally justified for being its own book. I think like it's super well developed as yeah. far as um, all the guilds and the the yeah. universe and the way it interacts. And plenty separate, like extremely separate from the main uh, D and D universe. Yeah. To to justify being its own campaign setting. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many how many pages long is the book? Let's see, I didn't look it's at like, that. It's like it looks uh, like it's at least a couple. Two fifty five. Two fifty five. So there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So this isn't a, like a little tiny PDF, a twenty five no, page PDF. No, We're talking is, about a really solid yeah, book here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a well developed book. Um, I don't think it's a blatant cash grab. I think okay. they did a good job on it. I think. Yeah. You know, who knows what happened in Wizards that, that kicked this off. If it was some passionate fan of both universes who happens to work for the company who wanted it to happen. Yeah. If it was, you know, a rising up of fan outcry or if it was a uh, executive who just said we need to cross the streams to make more money. Ultimately, right. the motive doesn't really matter. What matters is what product do we get in the end. And I think this is just a really good book. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a little biased as someone who's interested in both magic and yeah. D and D, so I'm right. probably pretty tightly within the target demographic. But right, I mean, I think you could pick this up without knowing magic at all, not caring about magic at all. Yeah, read through it and get interested in the setting and run a really cool campaign that you mm -hmm. would be that would be very hard to run in the normal D and D setting. Yeah, definitely. The, the levels of mm -hmm. intrigue and politics would put such yeah. a burden on you as a dm to create mm -hmm. all that so if you like doing it you know yeah. then obviously it's always been there you could do it but if you if you want to run it but don't want to do all the work of making up all the characters yeah. and all the factions and what what are the faction identities and how yeah. might all these factions run up against all these other factions yeah and, and how might they ally and how might they oppose each other like that's all been done for you here yeah I think that's cool because like mm -hmm. I, I run everything in Forgotten Realms, right? And none of that exists. Like yeah. there's a little bit of stuff with like some factions like the Zentarum mm -hmm. or like the Harpers and stuff, but mm -hmm. like nothing really fleshed out. It's just like a yeah. few paragraphs or about them or something. And know? I think in in traditional D and D, I think most of the factions are based on races. So mm -hmm. you go to a town and you know they're like, this is an elf town, you know. Okay. This is yeah. Rivendell, a lot of Lord of the Rings. Sure. And yeah. All the elves live here and they yeah. live in the trees. Or, you know, you go to the human city or the dwarven mm -hmm. hall in the mountains and everything. Um, yeah. And so when, you, I don't know, it makes it tense when you have, like, it makes it hard to build a party because the races, I don't know, I don't like how, how in regular D&D &D the races are so shoehorned into, or so boxed in personality-wise other than the humans. They yeah. tend to be, like, humans but less. Yeah. You know, like humans have this full breadth of emotion and experiences mm -hmm. and everything yep. and then elves are just the pretty you know arrogant yep. good at archery humans and the dwarves are just the just loud they just noisy, drink. drinking humans yeah just like the drink yeah yeah exactly. but humans can have the full range we're totally and the stereotyping the, the races <laughs> the races are stereotypes is what i'm saying <laughs> oh okay they were built to be stereotypes right yeah um, 
And I like in this one that it opens up a lot more possibility for the races. These okay. races can exist in any of the guilds. And right. honestly, like what guild they belong to is going to have more impact on, you know, what they value yeah. and, and everything and mm -hmm. what they oppose than their race is going to. The race is hardly going to even be relevant for a lot of, for most hmm. of the characters. Interesting. Cool. So, yeah, overall, um, I want to... Wait, the overall rating? Overall of the, rating, yeah. Of the book as a whole. Yeah, overall okay. rating of the book as a whole. So is it is it a five dragon rating? I'm gonna give it four point five out of five. Okay, do that here. Fine, four point five out of five dragons. Oh really? You're, that gonna, one you're, just you're, for you're, you're actually gonna do dragons, dragons for this one? Is but that, they're like oh, Niv-Mizzet wow. dragons. Wait, what's they're that? Not, he's the guild master of Izzet. He's a dragon. With is an Izzet he's dragon? A, he's a ten thousand year old dragon. But it's a dragon, right? But he is a dragon. So what color dragon counts. is it? What color? Yeah. Oh, they don't have draconic colors in magic. Like that. Well, they don't have draconic colors in magic? No, they don't have like the chromatic in them. They're all like red, basically. Oh, wow. Oh, so it's yeah. red. That's that's the DM layer color, red, so it works. No, he's, he looks different. He's got a he shorter snout. Oh, yeah, geez. look, he's in here. He's got a stat block right here in the Is It section. Oh, really? Why, why wasn't this part of your review, man? What? The dragons? Yeah. Because I wasn't reviewing the setting of Ravnica, I was reviewing the book. What's, oh. is it? What, what, where's that coming in the alphabet? G H I. There he is. See, so look. Oh, that's pretty cool. There he is. We'll show everyone. There he is. There we go. Four point five out of five little Niv Mizzet heads. All right, cool. That's awesome. Overall, good All book. Right. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so there's our review. Uh, any final thoughts on the book? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think uh, if you're a fan of Ravnica and want to play D and D, um, this is awesome. If you're a fan of D and D and want a politics and espionage campaign, this is awesome. Okay. Um, if you're a player who's just looking for stat blocks. Probably not for you. If you were looking for, you know, a city plane, mm. it's probably not that. Um, but it's going to be a really fun setting. Like, the second I got yeah. the book, I started brainstorming how I can run yeah. the campaign in it. Cool. That's awesome. Please smash that like button if you found this review helpful. And let us know down in the comments if you think Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica sounds like it's worth purchasing. If you like this channel, click here to subscribe. And click here to watch another fine video. And until next time, let's, let's play, play magic. magic. Wait. <laughs> well, you said magic. <laughs> we both said